Um, so where we were last time was, we've gone through the standard model and we convinced ourselves that at least, you know, at the 10, 20, 30 percent level, things are looking pretty good for the standard model. But we're not interested in things at the 10, 20, 30 percent level, we're interested in things at the 1 percent and then the next three levels, as far as we can go with this machine. So let's keep going. And so the simplest theory that you can even imagine, just to kind of get a feel for what can happen, is to take a standard model and add one signal, which is what we started to do. Um, so I took the uh, real scalar S, I took the standard model Lagrangian, I added terms that were allowed by uh, uh, a Z2 symmetry that I assumed that S satisfies, again, S is real. And then Lagrangian that I could allow would have an S squared H squared term. <laughs> The only way this thing can talk to the standard model that we're normalized for. And then I wrote an S the fourth term. I should have written an S squared term too, right? Nobody complained, but I should have done that. Um, and I've been a little careless about what's potential and what's Lagrange in here, so they're, they're mind signs that should be flipped. But um, the point is there's a quadratic and a quadratic term for S, just like there's a quadratic and a quadratic term for H, and then the only term which can combine them is this one. And that's because of the Z2 symmetry that requires everything to be quadratic or quartic in S. And because of our normalizability, we just forbid anything else. Of course, I could have no non-normalizable interaction if the effect in theory that I write it down breaks down the scale of order a few TV. I have some non-normalizable interaction from a one over five TV squared or something. We've already written down non-normalizable interactions for the neutrinos given the neutrino masses. There's no problem writing down non-normalizable terms. But let's just take the simple theory, which is effectively we're normalizable, any non-normalizable non terms are tiny. And we've already seen that something very interesting happens when we take, if we consider the phase of this theory, which S doesn't have an expectation value. And because the Z2 is preserved, S is the only particle, so it's the lightest particle, that carries the Z2 symmetry, so it's stable. It doesn't carry the standard model quantum number, so it's invisible. And after the Higgs gets an expectation value, there's a term which couples the Higgs to two of these S's, so the Higgs can decay of these things if S is light. And that gives the decay a, 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 an invisible channel for the Higgs, which could have been 100%, essentially, and now we know it can't be more than about 20, 25, 30%, something like that, depending on how generous you want to be. Um, so, uh, it's certainly something we want to look for. It's a hard measurement to do. So, that's one thing we're going to have to consider. We'll do it in a little while. First, let's consider what happens if we're in the other phase. Supposing the potential is such, the couplings here are, have the appropriate signs and values so that S does get an expectation value. What happens then? Did anybody try to work it out? There is a mix of these joint tests in H. Yes, indeed. Okay, so let's see how that works. So, again, the real focus is on this term, because if this term went there, the H gets a bad, S gets a bad, they don't talk to each other, there's two independent fields. So all the, all the interesting stuff that's going on in here, now what happens in here? Well now, instead of just writing H is B plus little h, again, let me ignore all square roots of 2, because we're just trying to get the project, we can work out the details later. But we also need to write, let's say, S, capital S is now its expectation value we'll called W, plus the fluctuations, which I'll call little s. And I have to plug that into here. So, well, there are lots of terms now. Basically, all possible terms are in there, up to quadratic order and other field. And in particular, well, of course, the linear terms cancel by assumption because the linear term, you know, cancel linear terms to find the minimum of potential. So there's a constant, and then the first non-trivial terms are a contribution to the S mass, a contribution to the H mass, and an, an HS term, which uh, let's be a little more precise here. Um, so we have uh, kappa times V squared, S squared plus W squared, H squared, plus 2v hs, and then there are cubic terms, so there will be terms like um, uh, 
Did I lose a two? All right, I'm not being very careful with coefficients here. I mean, so anyway, let me not worry about the coefficients. The point is that there are terms like V um, HSS and again some other coefficient times WSHH and so on. Okay, meanwhile, so we have these quadratic terms for S and H. We also have other quadratic terms for S and H, which will come from the standard model part of the branch and from this term. And in fact, from these terms. So there's quadratic terms all over the place. Just as there would be a capital zero. And the new thing is that the quadratic terms have an off diagonal piece. So when we find the mass matrix for when we find the masses for H and S, we're diagonalizing a two by two matrix for H squared, S squared, and H S. That's off diagonal, and therefore the mass eigenstates will be mixtures. So the physical fields will be phi 1 and phi 2, which will be cosine of some angle times h, and sine of some angle times s, and conversely minus sine of the same angle times h plus cosine of the angle times s. Okay, by definition, let's just take We'll define phi 2 to be the one that has the larger eigenvalue. Okay. So what we have to do operationally is we have to take this potential, expand it out to all the terms in H and S, take the quadratic terms, diagonalize them, we find the mass eigenstates, plug that back in, and work out all the interactions. We're not going to do this on the board. You can do it yourself with mathematical in a few minutes. But we don't have to see interesting things happen. Because we know that in addition to the mass terms that you just dealt with, there are now going to be cubic terms involving phi 1 and phi 2 squared, and phi 2 and phi 1 squared. So the interesting things are. Well, since phi 2 is, is heavier than phi 1, the really interesting point is that the possibility of phi 2 goes to phi 1, phi 1 is there if, obviously, m2 is bigger than twice m1, which might not be the case. Okay, so uh, what's the phenomenology of this situation? Well, there's a lot of things going on. One possibility is that um, beta is approximately pi over 2, and the part that we've discovered so far, oops, did you do the wrong? Yeah, sorry, beta is approximately 0. And the part that we've discovered so far is the phi 1, which is mostly standard model data for a little admixture or something. So it behaves very much like a hint, with a little bit of s. And so the part of it we haven't discovered yet is the one that's supposed to be s with a little bit of h. And by assumption, it's heavier. So we're looking for particle above 125 GV. Um, how is it going to be produced? So I want to make it. I want to make a phi two. Okay, it's part s. It's part h. How will I produce? Same way you produce the h. Right. Basically, the phi two in here, which is secretly part h, with a, a cos theta. Sorry, with a sine theta. Will couple the same way the h does by blue glue, or by a vector boson fusion, all the same couplings will apply. But, be careful. They will apply as appropriate for a particle H whose mass is M2, which is not 125 G. To say another way, let's go back to, to phi 1. Phi 1 is mostly H. So 
So what's the production rate for glue who goes to H compared to stand log? Well, glue who doesn't couple the S, except for the mixing of, of because S doesn't carry any quantum numbers, doesn't direct any colored particles. It only couples to S through this mixing. So basically, this is the standard model times cos theta. It's the same standard model calculation. Whatever goes on in this loop is exactly the same. And what comes out is an H. If you want to make phi 1, you're making it with weight cosine theta. So the amplitude is reduced by cos theta. And so the rate for gg phi 1, gg goes to phi 1, the moon goes to phi 1, is just equal to the standard model rate for the moon goes to h times cos theta squared. And conversely, the probability to produce Google goes to phi 2 is the rate for the standard model to produce a Higgs of mass m2 times sine squared theta. By assumption, I said phi 1, this is the case where m1 is equal to 125 dB. So the calculations I've already done for the case of the standard model just have to be shifted by a cos theta squared. But here, if m2 is 500 dB, I need to look up what is the cross section for a standard model case at 500 dB, and then multiply that by sine squared theta. So it's worthwhile for us to go back. and take a look at things we know about the standard model, because what, what, what we're really getting at is that all these plots, which I showed you, are relevant for this case, where part number one, if it's 125 GD, is the one that sits here with all the cross-sections reduced by cosine squared theta. And then there's some other part up here which has these cross-sections reduced by sine squared theta. And since we already know that cosine theta can't be too small, or our measurements that we've already done would disagree with the standard model by a lot, we know that in this case, sine squared theta is not a big number. So we're looking for a Higgs-like particle up here somewhere with cross sections reduced by maybe as much as a factor of 10 or more. Not easy. But at least we know kind of how to do it, because our friends at the experimental side already figured out how to look for Higgs bosons all across this range. So now we're just telling we'll look for another one, just with a lower cross section, which is just hard. It's the same general idea. Okay, well let's 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 make sure that that's really correct. What about how does how does this thing decay? How does phi 2 decay? The logic's the same. Phi 2 is mostly S, but unless this is here, let's assume for a moment that it's not. If m2 is uh, less than 2m1, then it's very simple. Because then phi 2 can't decay to phi 1s, and that means the fact that s couples to h's is sort of irrelevant. And s can't decay to any standard model fermions because it doesn't couple to them directly. So the only thing that can happen is phi 2, which spends sine squared theta at this time as an h, will decay the same way the h does. So phi 2 can decay to the u bar <coughs> with the same u column coupling but with, again, sine theta suppression in the amplitude, sine squared in the rate. And the same will be true for all of the phi 2 decays. When it's an S, it can't decay at all. When it's an H, it decays just like any H, except with mass, an H of mass N2. So, again, we have one particle that's 90%, let's say, uh, standard model case, and so it has these branching fractions. And its branching fractions don't change. The only thing that changes is the width changes a little bit. <coughs> if you take a particle, if you take this phi 1, and you ask how does it decay to BB bar, it decays exactly the same way. How does it decay to charm? It decays exactly the same way. All the branching fractions are exactly the same. The only thing is the width gets a little smaller by cosine squared theta. So this plot for our 125 GB particle is correct, just with a small shift down. And we don't measure the width anyway. If you were paying close attention, we have to measure the width. We've only measured branching fractions. Hard to measure the width of a very high 
Whereas, let's say our H is up here, our phi 2 is up here at 225 GB, let's say. So it's got a much larger width if it were a standard model particle. But all of its decays are suppressed by sine squared theta. So the width of the phi 2 is going to be reduced by a factor of 10. So we just need to remind our experimental friends, don't look for a particle that's quite as wide. Its resonance is not quite as wide as it would be if it were a standard model case. So let me summarize it. In this scenario, where S gets a F and mixes with the H, it's no longer stable because, because now our two ion states have some H, both have H in them, and the H can decay. And so if this one is 125 g, it's mostly like a standard model case with a small reduction in its cross sections and widths. This one behaves like a particle which is produced like a Higgs boson, but with a sine squared theta suppression, and decays like a Higgs boson but with a sine squared theta suppression. But when I say Higgs boson, I mean Higgs boson of mass N2. So all these things apply with appropriate reduction factors. And in particular, branching fractions all stay the same. The branching fractions are just the partial width of the total width. And both of those are reduced by sine squared theta, so that just cancels. It's just as likely to decay WW and ZZ as a 225 GV standard model case. So far, we haven't told these programs to do anything they don't already do. We just tell them to interpret their data. The really interesting thing is, well, what if this is not true? What if M2 is bigger than twice M1? Well, now, phi 2, in addition to all the things that H can do, has a new thing that it can do. And particularly produce a pair of standard model Higgs boson, standard model Higgs boson. So, in addition to all of these processes, whose partial widths are those of the corresponding standard model Higgs with the sine squared theta reduction, we have a new rate, and that rate is controlled by all these parameters, kappa and eta and so forth, that we don't know. It could be quite big. In fact, it's possible this S2 decays to, it's phi 2 decays to, to a pair of phi 1 essentially all the time. Certainly, significant fractional time. So let's suppose that's true. So let's take the possibility that phi two goes to phi one, phi one is dominant. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. That's a completely new type of signal. We're looking for pair production of the particle that we just discovered. A one hundred twenty-five GeV is being produced in pairs. How do we look for that? Okay, we have to answer that question. Okay, so that's this case. M1 is the 125 gene part. There's another case. What if M2 is 125 gene? And it's the phi 1 that's like. Well, If phi 2 cannot decay to phi 1, phi 1, then what I just told you a few minutes ago about uh, this case is pretty much the same. Again, we have a 125 GB particle, and now there'll be a Higgs boson like particle which is lighter, has a smaller width, but it's all the same branching direction. So that, that's pretty much the same. If, if, if phi, basically, if phi 2 cannot decay to phi 1, phi 1, whether or not phi 2 is the Higgs boson or phi 1 is the Higgs boson we've already discovered. Then we're looking for a second Higgs boson, which looks pretty much like a second Higgs, second copy of the Higgs at a different mass, with its own branching fractions, but produced with a rate which is sine squared theta suppressed. Okay, so that's pretty simple, nothing new again. But if M2 is bigger than 2M1, right, or in other words, M1 is less than 62 GeV, is speaking, 62, 63. Now the Higgs boson we've just discovered, one we already know about, has a new set of decays. It's decaying to some particle whose mass is below 62 GeV, and whose branch refractions, again, will be set by the fact that it's part of the Higgs, part of the H. So the branch refractions are going to be determined by continuing these lines down 
towards zero. Figuring out what's the branch and fraction of a 17 GB particle to the K to BB bar or tau tau. Gamma gamma. All calculations that you can easily do. Okay, let's take a step back. What did we just learn? You add one part of the standard model, you can get invisible decays of Higgs. You can get a second Higgs like boson with some different mass, which is harder to produce. You can get exotic production of Higgs boson, in this case in pairs. And you can get exotic decays of the 125 GeV Higgs boson, where it decays the two particles, which are light. This is a pretty simple model. So now imagine more complicated models. We have a lot of things to look for in this machine. Some of them are a lot harder than others. So one more time. Invisible decays, second things goes on, exotic production of the part that we already know, exotic decay of the part that we already know. That's four research programs. <laughs> right there. Yeah. You have still to keep the mu squared h squared term in order to get uh, that for h and then for x. Um, I believe that you, in the end, need all of the terms uh, in order to get a standard model like Higgs to come out with the mass and the expectation values that we know. But I haven't actually been through the. I mean, you, you certainly, let's put it this way there's nothing that would forbid that being there, right? It, just from the point of view of effective field, you expect that term to be there. There's no special symmetry if you set it to zero. It's going to get generated quantum mechanically. After all, that's part of how, that's the hierarchy problem, right? So there might be some slightly funny thing that happens if you set it to zero, but it's a purely you know, academic exercise. It's not going to be zero. And in any case, um, you'll notice that in the end, the phenomenology is really determined by the masses of these two particles at an angle, which is really only three parameters. Whereas um, I put in a whole bunch of parameters here, so it's actually, there, there are some parameters, stories of parameters which give you the same phenomenon. It's part of why I didn't bother to go through the details of how you calculate those. It's a mathematical exercise that doesn't teach you. In the end, this is the interesting physics. Two states, one mostly Higgs, one mostly segment, a little bit Higgs, two different masses. Okay, let's talk about Searches for things like this. Not all of them, obviously, too many. Let's do a little bit on the invisible Higgs. This is an interesting case. So we'll do invisible Higgs, and then we'll do something on Higgs pair production, and then we'll do something on strange shapes of Higgs. Alright, how do you look for an invisible Higgs? How do you look for an invisible Higgs? Well, it's not easy. Obviously, you, don't, you, you can't see something that you can't see. Unless it's produced with something else, right? So really, you're not looking for the invisible thing. You're looking for the stuff that's produced along with the invisible thing, plus missing transfer from momentum, which tells you that some invisible thing went off in some direction. And obviously, your background is going to come from, mostly, neutrinos, and also from detector problems. Every now and then, the detector does something screwy, and you fail to measure some energy, and it looks like something invisible went off in this direction, but you just made, you know, the detector made a mistake. Okay, so, so how is this done? Well, it's really not obvious, and so I'm not going to have you guess. Um, it turns out the best way to do this is to use the features of vector boson fusion production that I mentioned last time. And that is that if I have vector boson fusion, here's my collision, I'm looking at the event from the side, so the beams are here. I tend to get one jet which is fairly far forward. I remember why. It's because I've got a part coming in and it emits an off-shell W and comes out at a relatively low angle. And I've got a jet somewhere on the other side from the other part. I tend not to have too much going on in between these two because of the way the color flows. It tend not, tends not to be much radiation in this zone. And then I produce my Higgs, and my Higgs might decay to gamma gamma, or it might decay to, right, if, it's, if it's visible, and that's nice, you get two photons and two jets. But here it's not decaying to anything I can see. So my event looks like this. Two forward jets, plus nothing, 
inside. Right? And this is this heat transfer is going to off in some direction. And again, we don't know where it's going along the z-axis, so I've just drawn it perpendicular. So this is an event looked at from the side, with the beams going this way. If I look at the front edge on, with the beams coming this way, I'm going to have one jet going off in this direction, another jet going off in this direction, and then some missing factors will now affect the point of that. Alright, so it's a quantitative question. Is, is it possible to discover this? Well, it's going to depend on what the branching fraction is that needs to do this, and how often it is produced, and what the backgrounds are. What are the backgrounds? Well, obvious background is neutrinos. How do we make neutrinos? The easiest way to make neutrinos sort of stands out. Morning. <laughs> w is So you make a W boson. Well, the easiest one is to make a Z boson. Z boson goes up this way, two jets go off that way. The Z goes to neutrinos, so it's just like this. Now, most of the time when you do that, these two jets aren't going to have this configuration. If you make a Z here, it's quite likely that one of the jets will be sort of more in the central zone, the radiation pattern will be somewhat different. But this can happen. It certainly can happen. For example, I couldn't put a Z here. Two W's confused to make a Z as well as the case. Like, certainly, it can't avoid that. And it will also happen that just some simple process like uh, blue blue goes to Q Q bar with a Z coming off. Sometimes that will look like this. You have to be quantitative. To measure. To calculate. Um, the W can also be a problem. <laughs> if I make a W here and it goes to neutrino, it's going to produce an electron, something like it, right? So presumably I should take events that have two jets and missing energy, and if they have an electron, I should say, I don't want that event. If it is a muon, I should say, no, I don't want that event. It's in contradiction to my signal. But every now and then the electron is going to have very low momentum. And so you're going to sort of miss it. Or it's going to go down the beat. Or you can't get away with all. So you have to estimate how many you have left over. And W's are easier to make than Z's even. And they go to neutrinos more often than the, 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 well, comparable to Z's. So you have to always pay attention. And of course another possibility is that W goes to a tau in a neutrino. And the tau can go to just a single pion plus. You know, so you go to a, a tau which would look like just a single track, a little bit of energy over here. You have to decide whether you're willing to accept those or not. But at the very least, if you see a high momentum electron or a muon in this event, throw it out, it'll probably came from the W, but it's probably not coming from the Higgs. Okay, so those are the dominant factors. Z plus two jets, a little bit of W plus two jets, a little bit of QCD, because sometimes you make three jets and one of the jets, for some reason, just doesn't get measured. Doesn't happen very often. But you know the refrain, there's a lot of QCD. So you have to check. Okay, dominant background is from Z. How do we deal with that? We're going to throw a big Monte Carlo at it? What are we going to do? Let's just take a couple minutes to look at what the experiment was saying. I think you already know the answer. But it's important, I think, to, to just take a few minutes to dig in and look at what experimental say in their papers. Okay? This is messy, nasty look. I don't read the whole thing. I'm, I'm going to step you through a few points. Okay, there's always, somewhere in the paper, a section that says event selection. These are the events they're going to do all the work. What's the first thing they're going to tell you? Almost always, how they triggered on it. Right, so let's see what they say. We use events passing a dedicated trigger. That means they design a specific bit of trigger logic to pick events of this point. That requires a forward-backward pair of jets. That would be a jet over here and a jet over there, forward and backward. With transverse momentum greater than 40 GeV each, well-separated in pseudo-rapidity, that is to say, 
This one has positive eta, this one has negative eta. The difference in eta has to be big, has to be bigger than 3.5. Remember that 2.5 is like this, minus 2.5 is like that. So the tracker is a range of 5, and they're using a range of 3.5, which is still a pretty good chunk of real estate. With high invariant mass, the invariant mass of the two jets has to be greater than 800 GeV. And the reason that makes sense is because this quark is roaring in with a lot of energy and comes out with a lot of energy in this direction, and this one comes out in the other direction. Both a lot of energy, so they're not just low, they're, they're, they're just with relatively low PT, but they've got a lot of energy. Right? They've got a lot of momentum down the V5, and so the invariant mass is pretended, tends to be high. And missing transverse energy of 65 GeV, which is their word for the absolute value of the missing transverse momentum. All of those requirements go into the events even being written down. Okay? Uh, let's skip the next couple sentences, they're a little bit technical. Here's something interesting. We require a well-reconstructed vertex within the interaction region, which is about 24 centimeters uh, side to side, and 2 centimeters so, so inside the B-pipe, and at least 10 tracks, implying at least 10 tracks coming from that vertex. So, in other words, this, is, this seems like a purely technical point, but sometimes it's not. As they have made a decision that they're not going to, they're going to try to avoid problems of certain types. They want to have a vertex, remember there's a lot of vertices, right? There's, there's pilots, so there's a lot of collisions going on. Though they want a bunch of tracks come from this vertex, and what that intends to be is that at least one of these jets is actually in the track. The other one might be at such high eta that the particles it produces get reported by the calorimeters, not by the track at all. So they're trying to make sure they don't have a situation where they have two jets, neither of which has tracks. Because if that happened, how would they know that these two jets came from the same vertex? For all they know, one jet would come from here, one jet would come from here. At least if they've got a jet coming off of here, it's all coming from one place, they've got a reasonable chance that the jet that's coming this way has something to do with this jet. The momentum is correlated. So they need to know which vertex to play with. And this one jet tells them which one is the one they should be using. So then they measure all the properties of these things, and they throw out all the tracks that came from these other vertices as being irrelevant to the measure. We then veto any event with an identified electron or muon with PT greater than 10 GV. Why did they do that? Gets rid of the W. Gets rid of the W background. Not all of it, because of this requirement, 10 GV. If you have enough electron in 4 GV, they keep it. That's because sometimes QCD gives you crap that looks like an electron in 4 GV. You don't want to start throwing out those events. You need to keep your events in account. Jets are reconstructed using the particle flow technique. Let's ignore that. And an anti KT algorithm only for that. With a cone size of 0 0.5, they need to tell you this because if it maybe 0 0.4 or 0 0.7, the QC backgrounds are different. And you, need to, so you need to know this information. You need to actually work. Okay, um, let's skip the next sentence. The pair of jets that they pick is required to pass tightened versions of the trigger selection. So, what are they doing? They're take, they, they had the trigger, they selected some events, and now they're going to do even tighter constraints. Why do they do this? Let's see what they do. Now they say the PT of the jets has to be 50 GB, the eta of both jets has to be less than, it should be the absolute value, it should be less than 4.7, the two jets should be in opposite, uh, one should be forward, one should be backward, and the difference in age should be 4.2 now, not 3.5, and the invariant mass of the jet should be 1100 instead of 800. Why make this change? It's because when you say, I want to trigger on a jet of 40 GDB or above, the trigger is making a snap judgment. It has to make its judgment about this jet very quickly, within a second. Typically, some of the judgments are made within a much smaller fraction of a second, and then other judgments are made, uh, some of the final judgments are made within a second. Well, it's not going to be perfect. Sometimes a jet whose energy is 36 GB will look to the trigger like it has 42. Sometimes a jet which has 50 will look like it has 38. There's imperfection. 
And you want to get away from those imperfections because they have to model all of this. So they try to set the trigger relatively low and then select events a little bit higher so that they're confident that all the events above the threshold they actually use for the analysis were with essentially 100% probability selected by this trigger. They don't want to be dealing with the intermediate cases. That's very complicated. So they simplify the numbers. So that's why the trigger and the final event selection is different. And the missing ET is all the way up at 130 GDB instead of 65. And that's partly because if you're down at 65 GB, there's a lot of wacky things that can happen and give you missing energy that looks that big. And if the higher you go with the missing ET, the higher you go with the missing transverse momentum, the more likely it is that it's real missing transverse momentum and not some detected problem. Um, a central jet veto is applied to any event where the pseudo rapidity between the two tag jets has peak, uh, where the pseudo rapidity between two tag jets is between these two. I don't have this is poorly written sense. What they're saying is they've got two jets here, they're forbidding any significant third jet in the middle. That's that jet veto we talked about. And finally, the absolute full separation between the tag jets is required to be less than one, which actually means these two jets are either going to be close together than I've got in this, in this graph. All right, well, that's a lot of information just to tell you which events they chose. This is not that complicated compared to some of the ones you read. But every line means something. Nothing is done without a reason. Sometimes the reason is very obscure. And you have to call it your experiment, experiment with friends and get an explanation. Most of these we can figure out. Okay, well we're not going to go any further with that. But if you do, um, uh, well, you can always uh, ask me for advice. The next section is background estimation. Because you can't detect this stuff if you don't understand your background. So they have to tell you how they do that. So, uh, I'll just read one thing. The background arising from z goes to new nu is estimated from data using observable z goes to new nu decays. This is exactly what we talked about last time. You're looking for neutrinos, you measure it in mu. The only problem with that is that the rate for z to go to neutrinos is larger than the rate for z to go to muons, so your statistics is not so great here sometimes compared to what you'd like to measure. Well, there's nothing you can do about that. So what they actually do um, is more complicated, and I, I'll, I'll have to let you read this on your own, but they have to deal with all sorts of subtleties. So it, yes, it sounds like a great idea to use z goes to mu mu, and then just replace the muons with neutrinos. It's a great idea because you can apply exactly the same trigger criteria. Normally, if you have an event with two muons, you can say, I'm just going to trigger on the muons. And indeed, your trigger will select that event because of the muons. But the other trigger logic, the one on the previous page, is still running. It will still pick up that event, whether the muons are there or not, because what it's looking for has nothing to do with muons. Right? If I have an event which satisfies these criteria, and it has a couple of extra muons, the trigger still fires on it from this pathway, and they know that. So they can select events that were, that were they can look at events that were selected by this trigger and happen to have a muon. And that tells them a lot about what events they would select if the muons were replaced with neutrinos. So they know things at the trigger level, not just at the uh, at the level of so at the, at the level of um, the uh, the measurement that, that's done after the triggers pick up the events, just by looking at the events with the mu and comparing them with the events of the neutrinos. Nonetheless, there are all sorts of subtleties, and um, I'll stop. Right, well, the end result, uh, which I don't have on slide, but I'll just tell you. Um, did I write it down? Shoot, I think I forgot to write it down. Um, I know I, I'm going to give you the rough numbers. The, don't quote me because the numbers are not exactly right. And we can look this up after class. Okay, roughly speaking, CMS did a measurement of this sort. And the expected and the observed values 
of the limit on Higgs goes to be visible. Which I think was a 90% confidence limit, we haven't looked that up. 90% confidence means no more than a two standard deviation. Um, means it would require a two standard model, two, two standard deviation fluctuation for you to have missed it if it was there. Um, okay, I'm making up numbers here, it's something like this. Why am I giving you two numbers? They always give you two numbers, or two quantities to, to pay attention to. Why is that? What is expected? It means that if you ran this experiment a million times, you took the average, the method that CMS is using would, on average, be able to exclude the possibility that the Higgs boson is decaying invisibly 53% of the time. Of course, you do the experiment once, there are fluctuations. Sometimes you will succeed in setting a better limit because there were fewer events than you would normally have anticipated. Sometimes you set a worse limit because, well, it was a fluctuation of a few extra events. It happens there were a few extra events that resemble the signal, so their limit is worse. So that's the state of the art. Again, the numbers have to, have to be prepared. Um, Two comments on that. First of all, 90% limit is not 99.99% limit. Sometimes it turns out that you know, the limit is too good. Actually, it turns out something is there and you end up backing off a little bit. So don't forget, it's not 99.99. Um, the other point is that this is not yet at an interesting value given what we already know about the 125 GB. We already know that to the 20-30% level, this looks like a standard model of Higgs. If I dumped a lot of invisible width into the Higgs, it would probably mean it would screw up something else by now. So probably what you're really aiming for is more in the 20-30% range in terms of when we start to really put new constraints on this model. But clearly, it's, it's not wild enough. Okay, could have been the only limit they could put here is 100%. <coughs> They are getting there. This is something that measurement that can be done. And a measurement of the invisible width to the 10% level is conceivable in the next run, uh, if you look into the distant future. So don't be surprised if this gets down to 10%. It's not going to go to 1%. We will never know if the Higgs has an invisible decay at the 1% level, at this machine anyway. Okay, that's invisible. Um, all right, another, another possibility that we discussed over here is the possibility of some heavy Higgs, and it decays to by 1 by 1, which is the 125 GV part that we already know about. How should we try to discover that? Well, the Higgs has a lot of different decay, so it's not obvious what we should do. There's many possibilities. For example, we could look for, well, what, what do we know we don't want to do? We don't want to look for events that have absolutely gigantic QCD backwards. Looking for this thing, each of these things to go to B quarks sounds like a bad idea. Four B quarks have significant backwards. Again, it's four Bs, and maybe we tag all of them, or some of them, and that would help, but it's still a hard measurement to do. We're probably better off allowing one of them, let's say, to go to BBR, and another one to go to two photons. You pay a price with a factor of 10 to minus 3 here, but you don't pay much of a price there. Four photons would be a really easy signal, but you pay a price of 10 to the minus 6. You don't make enough Higgs bosons of this sort. Right? This thing is going to have a cross-section which is smaller than a standard model piece of the corresponding mass. It's going to have cross-sections, well, it's going to have cross-sections, but that means since the Higgs at, let's say, 400 GB has a cross-section that's a few picobarns, this thing probably has a cross-section which is a few hundred femtobarns. Multiply by 20 inverse femtobarns, that's how much data we have so far. 20 inverse femtobarns times 100 femtobarns or so, you're looking at a few thousand events. So, paying the price of 10 to minus 3, you're already getting you down to one or two events. So, we don't want to go down to four, four fold. 
So that's one option. And what's nice about this option is that gamma gamma gives you a peak. You know the mass. The bad thing about it is BB gamma gamma has reasonable background. It's not huge, but it's there. Um, here's another rather different possibility. You let the, the phi 1 go to two w's, and then this produces a laptop. And you train on a couple of jets. Or maybe even two laptops, but at least one. At least one laptop. Well, every time you add another electric particle, every time you add a photon or a lepton, you're reducing the background significantly. So that's good. And the price you're paying here is that W W star, the decay to, to a W and offshell W is down by about a factor of two. And then you have to require the lepton, that's another factor of two ninths. So you're paying about a factor of ten to go from here to here. Which means you don't have any events left. But at least there's almost no background at all. So this is also the zero background situation. It's basically you're not going to have a problem with any events with a lepton and two photons sitting right at 125 GeV plus some extra junk flying around here at this kind of energy. Um, but you also may have no signal. So that's a balancing act. Alright, so another possibility you could you could try is this W W star is nice because it gives you a lepton. Maybe instead of asking for gamma gamma, which is rare, we could allow W W star on both sides. And maybe this gives you a lepton, and maybe this gives you two leptons. Or maybe one of these is ZZ star, and that gives you two leptons. Three or more leptons is gener generically called multi-leptons. This has small backgrounds. How do you get multi leptons? How do you get three or more leptons? Uh, assuming they're real, honest to goodness leptons produced at the collision point and not something that comes in, some, uh, in the middle of some jet at some bottom. What's the best way to make leptons? Sine boson? You have to make two electroweak bosons. Maybe make a W and a Z. Maybe make a W and an offshore photon. You make two Z's. Two W's is not quite enough. So um, the rate for that is low, especially since the Z's, the, the W only goes to the left hands 20% of the time, the Z only goes to the left hands 6% of the time. So this is a very low background measurement. Uh, not zero background. And therefore, there's all sorts of different types of new physics that people look for in multi lepton shadows. It's a generic approach. It's very different from this one. Why? Because in this case, we're not going to be able to reconstruct the mass of the Higgs at all. There are neutrinos in the W W star decay. Or if we have ZZ star, well, two of the leptons, the one of the Z's gives us leptons, but the other Z may give us jets, so missing energy. We cannot reconstruct the Higgs here. So the advantage of this process, or this one, is that the backgrounds are very small, the mass is very well measured, but the disadvantage is the number of events is tiny. The advantage here is the number of events is actually a little bit bigger, not by much. But you can't reconstruct the mass, you just have to count. Do I have more events than I expected in the standard model from other sources? Or I should say, just in the standard model, since this is not standard. And you have to work out very carefully, and there are experts who have experimental experts who can give you eight hours of lecture on how you determine the background of the multi It's very, very complicated. It's one of the most sophisticated measurements that they do because you really have to keep track of everything that can go wrong. All of those fake leptons, fake taus, can be important, fake muons, fake electrons, the things that you would not think of if you're not an experimentalist and you don't look at all the different possibilities, things that your detector can do, things that bottom marks can do, things that offshore photons can do. All sorts of weird stuff. You keep track of all, and you try to work out how many multi lepton events you have of different classes. Because some multi lepton events, for example, those from WZ, two of the leptons make a Z. So you separate out that class. These ones won't make a Z in general. Right? 
So if you ask, well, what about multiple leptons where there's no Z boson within any pair of leptons? That's an even smaller value. So you have to study all of those cases. And they break them up into all different possibilities, and they do a counting experiment. They see, we predict that the standard model gives us, for this particular combination of E's and mu's with this amount of momentum, we expect at most one of it. So we see three. We see five. How significant is that? So that strategy can be used here, and it has been used recently. This strategy and this strategy were used recently by CMS. Put the first limits on this process. Not very strong limits as yet, but um, here they are. Okay, branch attraction, peak of Barnes, for blue blue goes to capital H, goes to little h, to, two pair, to a pair of little h's, and um, uh, these based on multi lepton and diphoton channels. And you see that they're putting limits on the production process times the branching fraction for this particle and this process in the few peak of arm range. Okay, now let's look at this plot carefully. We're going to see a lot of plots like this. We look at experimental plots. The green and the yellow bands give you expectations. Again, if you did this experiment many times, the dashed line is the limit you would expect to get, assuming the process is not there. So you know this measurement can't do better. The way they've done this measurement it can't do better than four picobarns. As I already mentioned, that's not really enough. We, we should be looking at a few hundred factorbarns. So this measurement is still not really good enough. But okay, that's the expectation. The green band is how much how, it is uh, essentially if I did the experiment a hundred times. 68 of those experiments are probably lie within the green band. It's the one sigma deviation. And 90 of them would lie within the yellow band. So that's the two sigma expectation. The actual limit is the solid line. This is what they got from actual doing the experiment. It is two sigma away, well, one and a half sigma away from expectation, which means they saw more events than expected. I don't remember if it was in multi leptons or in diphoton, I think it was multi leptons. They see a couple more uh, multi leptons than expected. So their limit is not as good as they expected. It's large by one and a half sigma, which happens every day. So that doesn't tell you much. Just says, well, if we do the experiment again with more data, if you start seeing this line creep up well above the yellow line, now you start to pay attention. So then I would tell you that there are quite a few more events than expected. Which might mean maybe they're seeing a signal. But at this point, that's not a significant. I think that means class is postponed. <laughs> All that thought, but um, do we have an exit from this room? Okay, so exit. I'll take you back to the series. We should make sure that we should actually. <laughs> okay. Um, I reserve that minute for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. More generally, we should be thinking about other ways that. Oh, yeah, right. So, um, I'm trying to understand what would the spectral line look like if you could keep it. If you, took, if you take more and more data, which is the question, if you take more and more data, that means that um, if, for example, you're doing one of these counting experiments, then your statistical error will be going down. Or in other words, the precision of the method you can make will improve until you get some systematic error which doesn't decrease. And that does indeed mean that the limit that you should be able to place should decrease as you increase the total amount of data that you have. Just more sensitive. These uh, bands will also uh, trick. Uh, why this range of masses? Why did they choose this range of masses from 250 to 360? I don't know. I don't see any reason why they should have kept going. Experiments will do this sometimes, and we'll not see why. And it may turn out that there's some little subtlety into somebody else wanted that data, and you get this bit of 
is a not really as sensitive up here as you want it to be. I don't know. Often you cannot guess, and often, honestly, it doesn't make any sense. It is a sociological problem that the communications that go on internally within the experiment that lead to choices about what to plot, how to plot it, how to analyze the data, what to consider, often get made without consultation with the theorists who would know enough to say, don't do that. If you do this measurement anyway, look at a wider range. There's so many examples of this, it just drives me completely nuts. It wasted a lot of time, and, you know, but it, it's very hard to fight because of the internal just it, all those discussions are internal, so you don't know they're going on until, until, the, event, until, the, until the thing appears. You say, well, why did you do that? And say, well, oh, we had some conversation and we decided to do it. So, that was a dumb idea. And you say, well, yeah, maybe. It happens all the time. Um, it's part of why communication between the theory and the experiment is so important, but also it illustrates that in some ways it's quite hard. Because all those discussions are internal. Um, Okay, that's production. What, what other ways? I mean, there, there's probably all sorts of ways that it could be produced um, in some bizarre fashion. We'll come back to one in a moment. So keep in mind, it's just one form of exotic production that we should really be looking for a lot. Okay, um, what about exotic decays? And that was the other possibility. That the Higgs we've measured, the thing we've discovered, decays to two light particles, which then again decay in sort of the way a Higgs boson of that mass, 17 GV, would decay. All right, well, you know, supposing I have a very light um, Higgs like object, what can it decay to? Well, uh, it can't decay to WW star or ZZ star, because as I push the mass down, the W and the Z are becoming more and more off shell. And so the rate for WW star and ZZ star drops very rapidly. On the other hand, the rate for uh, such a thing to decay to the bar, which is an on shell two body decay, is still pretty high. So this thing will still decay to the bar to charm uh, and um, tau and tau. And it will still decay to gamma gamma and blue blue because those blue corrections also. They're still there. So basically, the decays are similar to the Higgs we've already talked about, except the W and Z decays are not, are, are very, very small. So, uh, and now of course, if, if the final one gets light enough, then it can't decay to BB1. Well, if it's really light, it won't be able to decay to charm or towers. Maybe I should remind you to remember that he wants to be there too. Because if this thing has a mass of um, 600 MeV, well, it's not going to decay to these things. So it will mostly decay in I should say these decays go down too with mass. Can anyone guess why? There is a, a good scientific reason. Its effects grow with energy, which means as I decrease the Higgs mass, its effects decrease. So, in fact, it's the fermionic couplings, which are marginal couplings, dimension 4 couplings, that remain the most important as the mass goes down. So even these are not very important at low mass. So I'm looking for particles that decay like this. And if, for example, phi 1 had a mass of 600 MeV, then it would decay to muons a lot of times. So I'd be looking for a Higgs that decays to, let's say, two muons over here, and two muons over there, right? So I produce my Higgs, and it decays to a phi one going this way, and a phi one going that way, and these are very, very light. So think about the physics. So the particle I produced has a mass of 125 GV. The particle of phi one is very, very light, so it's got a very large boost factor. It's got a mass of 600 MeV, but an energy of 60 G, boost factor of 100. 
and that produces a pair of muons, those muons are going to be very close together, and another pair going the other way. That's a weird signal. Two muons here, two muons there, very close together. Well, um, that's not on the standard model list, right? If you take a standard model link, you're not looking for things like that. So that's, you need a dedicated search. So they've done a dedicated search for that. Um, one of the very few exotic decays for which a dedicated search has actually been done. Most of them, it hasn't been done. And um, here's the kind of thing you need to do. You need to check to make sure you understand if I produce a pair of muons whose invariant mass is very small, 3.5 GV or below, do I actually understand all the ways that QCD can do that? And you have to model it, because otherwise you don't know your back. They have to do that work. And then I didn't show the plot for what they actually find, because in fact the number of events they find of this type, where you have a muon pair over here of one mass, and have a muon pair somewhere else of exactly the same mass, the number of events that they find is zero. Okay? So, so far, the Higgs has not been observed to do this, which means you can put a limit on the branch current. I forgot to put the current on this. It's fairly small. But there's all sorts of other things. If this particle has a mass larger than 600 MeV, or larger than a few GeV, then you have to look for all sorts of combinations, like tau 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 tau, or charm charm mu mu, and so forth. And you've got to have a whole parade, a, pro a whole program of different searches to try to find if this is actually, if this process is actually occurring, of something like this. Well, there's a real technical challenge here. This is actually very difficult. Supposing 5.1 does have a mass of 17 GB, so it goes sometimes mostly to bottom quarks and sometimes to charm or tau, and occasionally dirtier, occasionally to muon. You're looking for, a for an event where the total amount of energy that's coming out of your Higgs boson is not more than 125 GeV. It's very low energy compared to the LHC. And you've taken that energy and you've divided it up among four particles. Right, suppose, uh, suppose, you have four, suppose you have four Bs. Each bottom particle is carrying a order 30 GeV, which means a couple of them probably have 40 and a couple of them probably have 20. That's really low energy. Right? You saw the sort of cuts that the, that the experimenters put. They, they like their jets 40, 50 GV and above. They like that missing energy of 100 GV. They like leptons with 20 or 30 GV of energy. These things are right near the bottom. This is right where the trigger starts to become a problem. And the backgrounds are a big problem. So, in some of these cases, it's not even obvious they will trigger effectively on these events, and even if they do, it's not obvious they can beat the background to find this stuff. So, when you take a very light particle, as the Higgs is, and you start to look for some of the weird things that it can do where its energy gets divided up into a lot of particles, you are pushing the limits of what the experimenters can do, which makes this a very interesting subject, and one which the experimenters have not explored that much, and even theorists have not explored that much. One of the reasons I've been spending a lot of time on it. Yeah? So, how are we supposed to understand Also in How are we supposed to understand the limits that they put in low range masses? Would they exclude a Higgs below? So, what they will do is they will say, here's a limit on the branching fraction for a Higgs of 125 GB produced in the normal way to decay to two particles of mass M with a rate with a branching fraction B. Okay, so as a function of the branching fraction for the strange decay, and as a function of the mass of the particles that's carrying the decay, they'll tell you what uh, what, what they have done. So uh, it's a good question. I don't think I actually have a plot in this case, but you see, you see the shadows coming, and they were able to Right, that was different because there you knew exactly what you were looking for. Right. You knew you were looking for a, the first thing you were looking for was a standard model of the You knew, so, so in particular, you knew exactly what sort of final states you were looking for. You designed triggers to look for those things, you make sure they were all covered, and you had a very well defined program of excluding or discovering the standard model of Here, you don't know the rate for phi 2 to go to phi 1 phi 1, and you don't know the mass of phi 1. So you have a much broader range of possibilities which you have to talk much more difficult. 
And therefore, it's also much more difficult to make the kind of limit plot that you described. You just say, well, I either excluded it or I didn't. You have to make it as a function of more parameters. OK, let's talk about the top part. Um, The top part obviously is very interesting. It's, very, it's the heaviest part by far among the fermions. Uh, it may have a very good reason for being very heavy. It may it couples most strongly with Higgs. Maybe it's involved in the, the story of flavor or the story of the hierarchy problem or some of the story we haven't even really understood is there yet. The top part is obviously a good place to look for phenomena. Um, this is not entirely disconnected from what I've just been telling you, as you've seen. But let me first. Um, describe what the top part does, or remind you. So almost 100% of the time, the top part the case would be W, and then two-thirds of the time that goes, well, one-third of the time that goes to UD, one third of the time it goes to CS bar, uh, one ninth of the time it goes to tau mu, or mu nu, or e nu. That goes to the branch of fractions to the, to, the, to the delta. Okay, I'm being a little bit crude here, right? There's actually CKM angles, so this is literally 100% of the time, and the W can go to US occasionally. Okay, but let's, let's ignore those some details. Basically, this is what happens. What you produce at the LHC is mostly, although you can produce one quark and one top quark at a time in certain circumstances, which I invite you to read about. The single top production is very interesting. But most of the time at the LHC, you're producing TG bar, and that means that you get six jets, two of which are Bs. So let's just say, let's say four jets, meaning they're not Bs, plus two Bs, um, about half the time. Um, you get a lepton, a neutrino, um, two jets, and two Bs, about half the time. Right? And you get a small number of lepton, lepton, nunubar, B. And that's about 5%. Okay, and I'm also being a little careless here because there are taus rather than mu's and e's, and L here. Okay, taus are almost not the same as mu's and e's as we discussed last time, we've got special properties, but let me know those details. The really important thing is that this is kind of what you have to play with when you're looking at the top part. This is the one with, with, which has both a large rate and a relatively small background. This has a small background, but you pay the price of the rate's low. So when you're making measurements of the top part, its properties, how, how often it's produced, how it decays, is it you know, produced more often at high energy, is there any resonance involving some heavy thing that decays in the TT bar, you're usually playing with these two final states. And this one comes in occasionally. But it's harder, much harder to work with. All right, well, that's what the top part is supposed to do, and that is indeed what the top part mostly does. This has been verified already in a previous experiment, and the LHC is helping us to uh, nail that. Uh, there is something funny about top part production. Um, it's called the top part forward backward asymmetry. And it was expected to be quite small, that is to say, if I've got a proton antiproton machine, proton antiproton, the expectation is that the probability that the top part goes in the same direction as the proton, as opposed to the other direction, is a ratio that you can ask. How, how likely is the top part goes forward as opposed to backward, where forward is the final direction of the proton? And the answer is well, it's a bigger asymmetry than people expect. It doesn't seem to agree with the standard model as people have calculated up to now. However, no one can make sense of this result in terms of new physics. People have tried, and almost everything anyone's ever thought of has been excluded by some measure that either done at the LHC or at the Tevatron previously, or at some, uh, or even at some precision measurement at LEP. And so, and no one can find a real mistake in the experiment. So maybe it's a mistake or a misunderstanding of the standard model calculation. This remains a mistake. It's a not entirely subtle question. Why is the top part forward backward? asymmetry in production different from what was expected. It could very well just be a combination of a small set of things. Not really looking good for it to be in physics at the moment. But it's not impossible. Other than that, and that's sort of the problem, everything else about the top part seems to agree with you. 
standard model predictions for top arches, they just didn't happen so far. Everything you measure at the LHC about the top part looks fine. How many seat masses? How many seat masses is the deviation? The deviation is in the two to three sigma range. Depends how you ask the question, as always, there's systematic errors and there's questions about the theory is kept very wrong. But yeah, it's, it, it's, it's big enough and the measurement is clean enough. It's not, it's weird. But it could just be standard model calculations. They're not accurate enough that there is a subtlety that we don't. Not previously written. And again, almost any type of new phenomenon that you could imagine putting in that would cause such an asymmetry should have shown up already at the LHC. There's nothing. The LHC has a hard, hard time measuring for a backward asymmetry because it's a proton proton machine. So they have to use some other terms. Proton anti proton, you have a natural forward backward asymmetry. Proton proton, it's symmetric forward to backward. So you have to be symmetry. You have to do something. Okay, one of the things that Gino has emphasized is that in the standard model, one of the very important things about the structure of the standard model is that you don't get at tree level any flavor changing recurrence. And the ones you get at loop level tend to be small. In particular, one of the flavor changing recurrence that you could get would be top goes to charm plus a photon or charm plus a Z. Or charm plus a gluon. These are all flavor changing neutral that are very highly suppressed in the standard model, and some bit of new physics that treats the top quarks especially different from the charm quark would introduce something beyond minimal flavor violation, or perhaps even with minimal flavor violation, you'll get some correction to this that you wouldn't expect in the standard model, be a deviation. And another thing you can get, which is unique to the top quark, is that it can't get with Higgs. And in many models, because the top part couples so strongly to Higgs, this is actually the largest. It's also the easiest to measure. Well, this isn't that difficult either, but this is, this is actually not too bad. How would you look for this? Well, the point is that the rate for this is definitely small. So if you make a TG bar pair, you know one of them is going to decay in the normal. And one of them is the one you're looking for to do something weird. So what we're going to look for is TG bar, where let's say the top bar goes to something that's easy to see, lepton, neutrino, beam. That's easy. If it goes to jets, it's not so easy. If it goes to towers, it's not so easy. So lepton here is an ear mu and a B quark. And then we're looking for this to go to CH, and then the H would better do something easy. For example, maybe it goes to gamma gamma. Or maybe it goes to WW. And from there to one or two leptons. Okay. Same strategy we had for two Higgs applies here with small adjustments. What are we going to look for? We're going to look for events that have a lepton and two photons, where the two photons make a 125 GB resonance. We may also want to require a BTAG to reduce background spread. Or we require a lepton in our BTAG and we look for additional leptons. We do a multi lepton search in the presence of a BTAG. And the same pros and cons that I listed over there apply. This one has a very narrow resonance but a very low rate. This one has very low. Uh, this this one has a higher rate, and also both of them have very low balance. Right, and so now there's a limit on this process, which comes from Atlas, which is about uh, the, the rate for top quark to go to charm Higgs. By measuring those two things, it's now about uh, one percent, a little bit better. And that's basically because they look for events that form lepton plus two photons, where the photons have a mass of 125 GB, and they saw none. Zero. Okay. So, so far, no sign of this. Okay. The top is the only standard model particle which can produce the Higgs against the K. That makes this a very important, important measure. Everything else can imagine too light. Of course, the Higgs could be produced in the decay of something exotic that we don't know about, such as a heavy version of the Higgs, or some other particle, some supersymmetric particle, or some heavy version of the top could decay to a Higgs. So we're interested in looking for the Higgs produced in some exotic way for a many source we can think of. One way you can do that, if you think about it, is you can say, well, suppose there's some heavy part 
I don't know what it is. And it decays to a haze, plus other stuff. I don't know what. The one thing you know for sure is that it's probably the case, because the Higgs is relatively light, 120 GV, and this heavy particle, I don't know, maybe it's 500 GV, maybe it's a TGV. It's going to kick the Higgs out like it's fired from a gun. So what am I going to look for? I'm going to look for the Higgs decaying, let's say, with a pair of photons, where those photons have high momentum and are not too far apart of the detector. Because they're coming from a Higgs that's moving fast with a significant boost. Right? So I'm looking for two photons, high PT, not too far apart, in delta R. Remember delta R? That's a combination of delta phi and delta eta. So close in R, and then behind the number. Well, in the standard model, the Higgs boson gets produced with a PG distribution. You produce the blue glucose to Higgs, it could be blue glucose to Higgs plus a jet. So the Higgs has a PT distribution, and it's not zero out in 300 GV. But there aren't very many Higgs bosons out there. So if you look at the PT distribution of your Higgs bosons, so you, you take Higgs boson going to gamma gamma, right, and you look at the PT distribution, which is not so easy to measure, because remember you've got a big background from, from QCD. QCD gives you quark, quark, quark anti quark goes to gamma gamma, so you have to do some tricks. But eventually, you, you find a way of measuring the PT distribution of the Higgs, and you expect it to look like this, so this is the expectation from the standard model. You may find that the data has a tail from Higgs bosons that are rarely, but nonetheless, sometimes being produced in the decay of some heavy particle. Again, a very generic thing to do. We don't need to know exactly where they came from, but it's a generic search. Sometimes, we pick particular models with particular final states and we do very detailed searches. Sometimes we take very general final states and we do very general searches. There's something to be said for both. We want to mix. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's talk about some of the other weird things that could happen in the world. I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, there's our Z boson. Are there any other resonances which simply, maybe they're similar to the Z, maybe there's some other sort of thing, but in any case they decay to E plus U minus or E plus U minus? Well, we take all the muon anti muon events that you've got, plus anything, you make the invariant mass plot of muons. I showed you this plot before, and we look, are there any bumps? There's one. And doesn't it look here like the data succeed in the background? Here's the background prediction. Look, the data's kind of high here. Isn't that interesting? Is that a violation of the standard model? Are you seeing something exciting and new right here? You've got to be really careful reading these plots. First of all, yes, this is high. Notice there's a gap between these two. That means that here, there were no events observed. So yeah, that's high, but the next thing over is low. It's not that there's a collection of bins that are high. The other thing is that, you see how these bins are all kind of, these, these, these values are all up here, they're above the background. But look at the background, you have to be very careful. This is the number of events for GEV. This is in fractions of an event. And then these bins have some width, which is really hard to read. So what's going on here is the prediction of the number of events per bin is below one. And some of these bins have one event and some of them have zero. And so the reason that this is above there is that this predicted half an event and there was either one or there was zero. So this one's above, but that one's below. When you see data that flat out like that, it's probably because the number of events is down to one per bin. Um, here's the limit they extract from here. This is a limit on the cross-section relative to the cross-section of the z. That's why there's these funny numbers here. So it's, it's the cross-section, that, that, that way various things cancel. That's what they put it there. Basically, it's, in, in, it's, it's a cross-section measurement as a function of the mass. And you see, again, the blue line is the expectation. The green line and the, and the yellow line are, again, 68 95% expectations. 
The black line is the actual limit. You notice that it wiggles all over the place because sometimes there are a couple of extra events, like this wiggle here is at about 1500, 1600, 1700 GB, and there's a wiggle there. The limit's not quite as good as you'd expect because yeah, there are a couple of extra events in that gym. But it's still only two sigma. And then here, these are predictions for some models. This is what you actually get from the data. This is somebody's model. And what this shows you is that where the model and the expectation line cross is where the limit is. So for this particular model, this blue one, which is some z prime sub psi, it comes from some uh, S of, sorry, S of some E6 model, of granification, doesn't matter, the limit is at 2400 GeV. Because here, the cross section is so high that it's completely moved out. And here, the predicted cross section is so low that it's not moving. That's where they cross the limits. By the way, why is it flat like this? Any guesses? You zoom out there, you can see You zoom out there, you zoom out there. This is a data question. What, what is it about the data that tells us that it's flat? It, it's not entirely true to understand. What it means is that, they didn't show it, is that above this event, there are no events at all. So they put a limit. If there were a particle here, and it had a cross section of this size, it probably would have put one event on this plot. And there's the So you'll often see this at the very end of the flat. And, um, and a Z prime could be discovered way up here. That's why they put limits to 2500 GB, because if you extend this plot out to 2500, there could be a couple of events there. They don't see it. Standard model would predict far less than an event. This is a, another similar plot for digests. This is sort of brand body. You collide two protons, what do you mostly get? You mostly get jets, you often get digests, that's the process with the largest cross section. And now you make a plot of uh, the differential cross section relative to, uh, the, with respect to the invariant mass of the two jets. In kilobarns per GeV, so the bins are in, uh, in GeVs here. And they're running from well, 1 TeV up to 5.5 TeV in this plot. What can you learn from this? You can learn a lot. So, this particular plot is used in this analysis to look for bumps. They're looking for some resonance in the case of two jets. Right? And, and this is a log plot. So here's a bump uh, from some model, and here's another bump from some other model with you know, some horrible mass 3.6 TeV. And it's a little hard to read because it's a log plot. It's hard to tell how much of a bump this would be on this plot. They kind of show you that down here, where they take the data minus the expectation divided by the number of statistical um, standard deviations. And so what this blue line shows you is how many standard deviations you would expect this bump to cause in the data. And they show you what you actually see in the data in standard deviations away from the expectation. So you don't see any bumps here. If there were, if there were real physics here, you would see a whole bunch of bins that are three or four sigma above the expectation. You don't see that. So there's no resonances here. Um, what do they really do here? Well, there's a, a dashed red line here, which is a QCD Monte Carlo. It's a QCD Monte Carlo that does two to two scattering, accounts for all sorts of issues, does it next to leading order, maybe next to next, I don't think it's just next to leading order. Um, and it's been adjusted to fit the data up here, but the shape is given by the Monte Carlo. And they've also got a line here, which is the blue line, which is the fit to the data. So I presume that the Monte Carlo has been adjusted to do a pretty good fit to the fit. One is the fit to the data, and the other is getting the Monte Carlo to line up with the fit. And it's remarkable how well it works, right? I mean, look at, look at that. It's a test of QCD, it's a test of the QCD Monte Carlo, it's a test of how well the detector works. In some sense, it's a cross check that everything's working for the most bread and butter estimate. And it tells you a few other things. It's a test of quantum field theory. Right. Basic quantum field theory is not breaking down to 5 TV. For all we knew, that was going to happen. I mean, at some point, quantum field theory not, it might not be right. Well, it's at least in its basic form, right up to 5 TV. Um, there's no big new phenomenon producing jets. For example, 
what kind of phenomenon could you, could you imagine? Well, um, if in fact the notion that there are large extra dimensions of space were correct, and we're stuck on some defect in space time, that the reason gravity is so weak is because there are extra dimensions that have some volume. Rather than the scale of gravity being really high, the scale of gravity is actually just at a TeV, which would make you think gravity should be much stronger than it is, but if an extra bit of volume that we don't participate in will weaken gravity. If that were the case, we should be hitting quantum gravity at the few TeV scale, and quantum field theory should be starting to break down. There should be gravitational effects. QC prediction should be corrected. They're not. So, there's no major breakdown of the whole framework of quantum field theory, even at the highest scales we can measure. That's an important lesson to apply. There are no other plots of up to 5 TV because digest is the most common process. Anything else, you're not going to see it all the way up. You're not going to events all the way up to that energy sphere. And so, with one last one of those, then we'll do something else in the last five minutes. Here's looking for W primes. Remember how you look for a W? You look for a shape in the transverse mass spectrum that falls off. Right? So, the W, though it's not plotted down here, but if we extend this down to 80 GB, we can see the W as sort of a triangular shape. It comes up and then drops off rather suddenly. And here is what a W prime of 500 GV and one to one of 2500 GV would look like. This one would be falling off here, this one would be falling off, off the plot. Well, you don't see much here, right? This is pretty smooth. And then here it's a little harder to interpret because, again, this is sort of one or two events per bin. So some of the events have one, some of the events have zero, some have two. There's one event way out there. That's an electron. There's an electron of 2300 GeV. And indeed, when you look at the plot here, the dashed line is the expectation. And yeah, there's a little bit of an excess up here, two sort of two sigma, but it's probably driven by that one event. So you have to be careful, even if you have an excess, if there's only one event involved, one event, one weird event happens. It's just one event. It's not Gaussian statistics at that point, it's Poisson statistics. If you can change the result of an experiment by removing one event, you probably shouldn't be too confident in it, no matter what the statisticians tell you. Right, so this is an excess, but it's being driven by a very small number of events, but not enough at this point. Um, keep an eye on it. Do you see any more events like that? Get it? Just... Okay. No W primes that we know about, no Z primes, no resonances going into <coughs> objects. What else can we do? We look for things in our presence. <coughs> The most classic thing we can look for is supersymmetry, but the point about doing searches at the LHC is it doesn't matter most of the time that you think you're looking for supersymmetry. In the following sense, any given model produces lots of possible signatures depending on the parameters. We already saw that in this model. And any particular signature can be driven by many different models. So when you say, we're looking for supersymmetry, what you really mean is, we're looking for a particular signature that somebody's supersymmetry model motivated us to look for. What you're really looking for is that signature. And then there can be a dozen other models which are also sensitive in that search. So a classic thing people look for in supersymmetry, because it involves particles that have to be there. I mean, supersymmetry just isn't supersymmetry unless there's a Guino. It has to be a part of the group one. It's a fermion. And like the gluon, it's a color on tech. And so therefore, like the gluon, it has a very large cross-section. Therefore, it's a very good thing to look for. I'm going to take five minutes because we started five minutes later. Um, so for example, blue blue goes to Guinos. Okay, what happens to the Guino next? Well, the only type of couplings that gluons have are couplings to quarks and sparks. Just like the only couplings that gluons have are to themselves or to quarks and antiquarks. And then the spark may do something like decay to a quark, and well, there are various possibilities. The simple one would be it decays to the lightest partner of the Z photon in Higgs, which is called the lightest supersymmetric particle, LSP. which is a neutral, stable, 
if R pari is preserved, it's a neutral stable particle and it's perhaps it's dark matter. So what's your final state? Your final state is two jets from each gluino and an invisible particle from each gluino. Four jets plus missing energy. More generally, if I have any colored thing, anything that carries color, that then decays to dark matter from any model, it doesn't even have to be dark matter, just it decays to something that's, it doesn't carry SU2 cross, uh, it doesn't carry SU3 or U1 quantum numbers, then I'm going to get jets and missing energy. So we should look for jets plus missing energy, not just because it comes from supersymmetry, it, it comes from lots of things. So that's what we do. How do they do it? Well, let's focus on. So here's a search from Atlas. They look at two jets, three jets, four jets, five jets, and six jets with missing energy, and they choose all sorts of different combinations. Let's just look at one of them. So they're going to look for four jets where the missing transverse momentum, that's what this says up here, has to be 160 GV or more. The first jet has to have a PT, a transverse momentum of 130 GV. The next has to have a transverse momentum of 60, and so do the next two. They require, this is what this says, that the missing transverse momentum does not point directly at one of the jets. Why do they do that? So, in other words, they're okay, just looking at four jets, and they demand that the missing transverse momentum doesn't point this way along one of the jets. Why do they do that? The time is too much. The question is, what is the biggest mistake they're likely to make, which would be the fake missing energy? And the answer is, they badly mismeasure one of the jets. Something screwy happens with the jet. It's really a jet there. It really has 500 GP of momentum. But two of the hardest particles went into some crap between two of the detectors, were badly measured, and the jet comes out with 200 GV instead of the actual 500. And now they have fake missing energy of 300 GV. Well, if you, if you insist that this missing energy doesn't point at any of those jets, then mismeasuring one jet can't do that to you. Mismeasuring two can, but that's very rare. So, they make, they're trying to reduce the fake missing energy. And then they demand that the missing energy be a significant fraction of all the kind of total energy of the event. I call that ST or M effective, and they require the M effective be 1200 or 2200, and the missing energy be a quarter of that one. Okay, and then they make plots, like this one. And I should say, before they make plots like this one, they make these. These are control regions. These are control regions for determining backgrounds. You notice that in each one of these plots, there's, they're all log plots, there's one color which is dominant. That's because they've chosen an event selection so that most of their events are photon plus jets here. <clears throat> they're going to use photon plus jets as a surrogate for Z plus jets, the photon to Z ratio is something you can calculate with precision QCD. So if they measure photon plus jets, then they can predict Z plus jets, and then they can figure out how often Z goes to neutrinos plus jets, which is a big background to four jets plus missing momentum. There are also backgrounds from W plus jets, where you miss a lepton, one of the world where you miss the lepton from the W in some way. Well, they've got a control sample that's dominated by W plus jets. And then they've got a control sample that's dominated by TOPS. And TOPS give you a background here because TG bar plus jets is big. Maybe one of the TOPS, maybe both TOPS go to TAUs. Both TAUs go to hadrons. So there aren't any leptons, it just looks like hadrons, of sorts, various jets, and missing momentum from neutrinos that are produced along those TAUs. So having done this, then they can make a plug like this one. Where they add, where they now go to the signal region, the one that I showed you in the previous plot. They make those particular cuts on the jets, they choose that particular combination, and now they make plot, and they look, they put all the data, they put all the backgrounds together, they put the data on top of the backgrounds, and they're looking for a signal that is very hard to see here, but basically um, it would produce a tail. Very small, but nonetheless noticeable tail. And they don't see it. So they put a limit on the wheel production. Right now, the wheel limits are in the 1400-1500 GeV range. For the All right, we're out of time. So to do that, I want to say something about top primes, which doesn't make people look for. 
top prime, so I should say top partners, like there are top partners in, the, in, in uh, supersymmetry, called top sparks. There are top partners in all the sorts of models that Raman talked about. There are always top partners. You have to cancel the top. If you want to solve the hierarchy problem, you have to cancel the top four group that corrects the Higgs mass. You need something else. So we look for top partners of all different sorts. We look for dark matter in various ways. We're looking for missing energy plus other stuff. We're looking for um, weird things. Things that can be very complicated, strange final states. We're not looking for them very efficient, efficiently yet. That has to be looked for. So there's an enormous range of stuff that has to be done with this machine because we're looking, we don't know what we're looking for. We're checking the standard model every way we can. And then we gotta go in all sorts of different directions. So the challenge, your challenge, is that uh, you have to help us make sure we've done all the searches we should do because we sure as heck don't want to miss something in this data set. So that's both a matter of thinking about the theories that could deal with some of the problems of particle physics, thinking about the signals that such theories could produce, and thinking about what the experiments have done and have. All right, so I'll stop.